Hello, welcome to Stranded Bricklayer. In this video today, I will be showing you this brick project that I just completed. This is a second hearth that I've added into my home that I am currently expanding its wood heat capabilities. This is my second hearth. In a sec here, you'll get a chance to see the original hearth that I've heated my house primarily with wood heat, uh, supplemented slightly with electrical. And I did do a propane conversion to my furnace last year, but I just, I, I really hate uh, forced air so much. You know, I granted, you know, probably wouldn't be so bad if I sealed up my ducts a little bit better. I think there's some damage in the crawl space. This is a, in a, it's originally actually a dual wide trailer. Uh, it's, you know, been renovated several times and it would appear to be a modern modular, but uh, the, the ducting is pretty bad in it. And with pets, and my sensitivity to allergens i just you know not extremely sensitive but enough that it it really uh it, it bothers me uh enough that i just prefer to go with the wood heat and you know with uh current you know political events everything else that's going on there's just good reason to have you know not not to mention living in canada it's really good reason to have wood heat backup or some kind of you know uh, supplemental uh, heating throughout the winter especially in rural areas which uh, which I, I certainly do live in I live in a small village of about 300 people and it's not uncommon for the power to get knocked out here more than other places and you know just for me going on the wood heat for the last seven years it's just been a little bit of a nuisance I'm trying to find better ways I the the main reason I wound up with two stoves because I had two stoves because I had a uh, stove actually given to me uh, which we'll actually get into so this is this is the current project and unfortunately I didn't uh, I didn't have a chance to wash this yet I wanted to wait about another 12 hours of making this video I, it takes a long time to process one of these videos so I just kind of had to get it out while I while I could and uh, I'll try to maybe update the thumbnail. I'll do a good thumbnail once I do get this washed and get the stove installed. So you can see here in a, in a second my original stove, me bringing it in. Uh, this was given to me a, by a good friend and I upgraded the size. So this is about 90% larger than the original stove I had, the stove that I'm moving to this area. And... Uh, yeah, one of the biggest problems with me, you, you know, running, especially with a job when I do work in the winters, I don't always work winters, is just, you know, running the electrical heaters as a supplement, which is absolutely necessary in, you know, basically January, February, March, and then getting home every day if I am working and the heat just being, you know, completely, completely gone, right? So you can see here. This, I actually managed to move this in by myself. This was a bear of a task. And, you know, I did have to do some modifications to a, a small feature that I had outside. This was uh, an, an unfinished project. I never even got around to properly grouting this, but I nevertheless I had to make a modification to get this in. And uh, luckily my picker truck uh, that I built was able to get uh, the stove high enough to be able to, for me to move it in. And yeah, that's a, that's the biggest problem that I, I was struggling with is trying to keep the house warm. So one of the, you know, one of the, you know, considering if you see here, considering how large of a of a stone feature this is, this is uh, brand name cultured stone actually that I used here. You can see this is a fairly thick stone. There's there's about two inches worth of stone and mortar here for thickness, and it does go down a hallway as well. And that was my you know my intention for making this stone feature so large was for it to be a bit of a heat sink and the stove that i picked up was uh is and i don't unfortunately don't have a picture of it yet but was rated at 2,000 square feet which my home is only at a 1200 square foot trailer so it should have been enough but it really just isn't the fact of the matter it just isn't so i got this stove which is nearly twice the size and i'm hoping between these two stoves and between the massive amount of you know stone that i have here you can see this is true brick this is actual natural brick i was planning originally on going with 
more of this stone up the sides here but i fact of the matter is i ran out of the stone and i had this brick yeah, it's a very actually very nice brick and you know i figured what the hell because this additional brick will work as a great heat sink as well hopefully between the two stoves between all the stone you know i may even start st uh, stacking stone on top of the uh, stone or bricks on top of the stoves as well just to add more of a heat sink the heat sink factor isn't as significant as i i'd hoped it was but um you know just every every little bit helps and if i can i can have this be not so uncomfortable in the mornings especially because i don't like waking up in the middle of the night to feed the stove and the stove my previous stove was always 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 completely out of coals in the morning so i'd always have to restart the stove there would occasionally once in a while be maybe a few coals left but in this new stove i'm certain i'll have enough coals left in the morning and if I have to rest, you know, restart the fire in this stove, it won't be that much of a bear. At least, again, I'll have more of a heat sink, and I'll have more heat, uh, you know, between the two stoves. Just that much more of an advantage. I'm, I'm feeling fairly confident. I'll need to rely very little on my uh, electric heaters this winter, even if I do end up having to work, which is looking pretty likely that I'm going to. I'm actually currently looking to get back into welding because masonry just been too much of a, a bear in my body, especially with this pre-mix mortar. Maybe that's what I'll talk about in this uh, part here. You can see me wetting my mud board and uh, let's just have another look at that actually. Pre-mix mortar is like a dual-edged sword. For one, I personally hate these 80 pound sacks these 80 pound sacks are you know typically in my area what you're going to find in commercial suppliers and then we have these 25 pound sacks here uh sorry 25 kg and these are 40 kg sacks uh, which you're typically going to find in commercial suppliers and these are what you're going to find at home depot i wish everybody sold the 25 kg sacks because you know granted it didn't really help in the industry much anyways because what ends up happening uh they call them back savers in in some areas they don't end up saving your back is what they end up doing is because they're slightly more than half of one of these sacks and your employer is just going to end up making you carry two of these sacks at a time once these come out so it ends up even being worse than these sacks but if you don't work for a legitimate nazi <laughs> like i used to or uh you know like a slave driver uh you know the, then these sacks are great and and for my own personal use i absolutely love them the trouble is that they're so much more expensive than these you can almost get the 25 kg sack for the same price as the as the 40 kg uh, so i just kind of want to make mention quick mention of that the other thing too you may be able to see here is uh it's a little bit too fast of a time lapse but i always wet both sides of my mud board just a little bit of a pro tip there you know you can never get laborers to actually do that for you you know no matter how many times you ask yeah you can't quite really see it but uh, nevertheless we'll get into the start i've got everything now granted you know there's no reason you can't just uh make marks down for your first row of brick when you're doing your layout if you're working with the same material repeatedly over and over and over again there's no reason you can't do that the thing the reason i like to lay my bricks out uh you know and, and actually see it in place before i start my layout is because sometimes depending on the material again if this is a material maybe that you haven't even using before uh the variance between the materials themselves can be drastically different you know a lot of times a lot of uh, material suppliers are kind of sloppy and there can be up to a quarter inch difference between some of the bricks uh, so that's something maybe you can cut off right off the start and if you're not so experienced with doing layouts, it's a good idea to just do that as well, just to, uh, you know, just to quit, you know, save yourself some mistakes because everybody does it. I guarantee, especially if you're new to the trade, uh, doing layouts, we call it putting a half in the wall where, you know, you, you start with a full brick on one side and a full brick on the other side. And then when you get to the middle, sometimes if you just have it by measurements in your head, you may end up getting to the middle and it doesn't work out to a full brick in the middle and you end up having to put a half in the wall, uh, which you, you know, uh, typically you would just tear all the bricks back up and, and then start with the right brick at the other end of the wall. But if uh, you're in an industrial situation, maybe 
so whoever did the layout made the marks wrong and then you build your leads up which you won't you'll see me actually not doing in this video i don't build leads in this because i'm doing everything on my level so i do it course by course you can see me putting the fasteners in here quick too uh so if if both of your uh you know your 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 top bricklayers are on the ends that they think the layout they think the marks are right they build both their leads up or ready to go rebars have already been drilled and the next thing you know there's a half in the wall if it's something that's maybe not exposed or not maybe not super critical sometimes we'll just leave it right and it's unfortunate but it is what it is and it's, it's very embarrassing it's very embarrassing it's happened to everybody i swear it's happened to everybody um okay so you've got you see me put the fasteners in those are standard brick ties uh in in different applications you'll see different wall fasteners used uh, these do allow a little bit of flex in the wall so that is sort of necessary you'll see that in the more industrial fasteners they're actually an l plate that bolts to the wall that has a slotted section and then it's a, a it's a piece of thick wire it's about a quarter inch thick wire that goes through the slotted section which keeps the brick from falling off the wall like it'll keep it from falling off the wall but it does allow movement up and down so you don't get uh you know cracks and damage uh, from things binding up if there is uh, displacement or movement so it allows allows for that movement that's uh, one of the things you learn when getting into bricklaying uh, initially is that mortar is designed to be weaker than you know that's the reason the lime is put into the mortar is for uh, plasticity for one for malleability to be able to use it with a trowel and uh and then also it does give it a bit of uh, compressive strength it gives it some flexibility so that the wall can actually move and stretch and, and and bend sometimes i've seen walls actually snake before uh damaged walls that have been blown over in the wind that we end up having to knock down uh and and you'll actually see them snake and there's very uh, little damage oftentimes to the to the uh to the joints themselves even after uh they move like a like a sheet of paper in the wind so again i'm putting more fasteners in and i'm gonna put quite a few fasteners in here you can see a little bit of water damage in here i did test those studs it's perfectly uh fine uh i did seal up the exterior of this window and uh poly right here is is an interesting note to make it's a good idea to put poly up over the windows so if you do happen to you're walking maybe up top here and you do end up having happening to drop something that you don't end up damaging the window it's it's some very cheap insurance and you can reuse it i keep all kinds of poly with me and bring it around i also i have a nice piece of uh, canvas here laid down for uh protecting the the stone base and yeah so uh this poly though you'll see maybe eventually in uh, my thumbnail if i do uh, update it i do actually have these polys up here all year round i use it for uh, temperature control to help defuse the light as it comes in for privacy and then in the winter uh, for added insulation i do actually have a, a layer of poly here and i also have a layer of uh, what would you call it uh, vinyl or laminate flooring subflooring that uh, sort of styrofoamy kind of uh, spongy stuff trying to trying to get the house as efficient and insulated as possible Again, you can see as how thick these brick are here and the voids in the brick will just add again as more uh, thermal barriers uh, just doing as much as I can to, to try to make this as efficient as possible I've got a few solar panels which you know aren't super useful in the winter but uh, you know trying to you can't completely go off grid especially living in uh, you know an actual town or village or, or wherever city you, that you may live in but uh, you can get close and and especially with like again civil uh all the all the crazy stuff going on in the world right now luckily you know so i do live in actually in canada uh like as i mentioned and you know luckily it's not going to be as bad here as it is in europe i don't think they have great ways of actually transferring uh, natural gas uh, not unlike Russia I believe that has those gigantic freaking crazy looking tankers you want to google one of those sometimes actually so they're crazy looking tankers for for moving natural gas I don't think that's a, a very common vessel and I only get something that Canada maybe even has so I don't think we're gonna have 
even though the commodity prices in some parts of the world it could be pretty extreme i don't think we're going to have that much of a problem here in canada nevertheless it's it's good because you don't know you know the power grid goes down your furnace isn't going to work regardless right it's not like you can just uh, crack a line and have a flame blowing in your house and uh you know you might still have gas pressure but it ain't going to do a whole lot of good unless you have a gas stove and then you're just going to risk you know the, the chance of carbon monoxide poisoning uh so i'll just make quick mention here this is about you know with the stone and the brick here uh, maybe even the brick alone is, is roughly about $1,000 worth of materials between the mortar and the brick and the brick ties. And uh, I ended up using, just on the brick alone, I ended up using, what was it, four, eight of the 80 kg bags. So pretty significant. And then I ended up, unfortunately, ended up bumping, bumping the, the terminal for my light here. So you're gonna, it's going to get a little dark for a second throughout this portion of the video. Um, now you can see me going around the window here. I left, I left a few of these bricks out. I'm going to end up installing Rolox here. You'll see, I'll try to get you as good as a, a view of these Rolox when I do go to install them. There's a special, uh, way you do the end Rolox. So it's actually a, a, a nice design. It doesn't have that edge with the holes on it. The Rolox is essentially just a brick cut in half. Uh, usually half, you know, you may have to, depending on your, uh, bond here you're gauging you may have to cut them down slightly or sometimes or depending how far away from the wall they are they may have to be a little bit longer or shorter but they're essentially just a half a brick laid on its side and that gives you a sill so essentially what they are is a sill and then you've, you've probably seen me uh measuring these lines here you can start to start see, see you can kind of see some of these lines uh these are my my gauge lines which i you know you you have this gauge tape and a gauge tape is essentially the same as the tile tape you may be aware of uh, these special tape measures for doing brick and tile they're not like a regular tape measure they may have a portion of them that does have inches or uh, metric measurements or something like that but what they actually are is there are different heights different thicknesses of brick here uh, that you're using you know over the industry there's all kinds of different thicknesses of brick uh, there's, whoop, there's generally only uh, a couple different sizes that you'll see most of the time, uh, pretty, pretty common sizes, and that's what these brick tapes are for. You have your like imperial size and your metric size, and what these brick tapes do is because you never, the, the distance to the top of a window may not always be the same, or the, the height of the window may not always be the same, so you're, you're going to have to maybe make these joints a little bit thicker or a little bit thinner depending on what height you need to hit here. And my most important two heights were the roll lock to the bottom of the window and the uh, ledge that you'll see me install the angle iron for here for over top of the window. So when, uh, so those are the two parts that I, two points that I mark. And then I can use this tape measure that gives you 10 different thicknesses of your joints to help you gauge to hit those points and then you can lay those marks out and then you try to just stay on those bonds and you're going to hit exactly where you want to hit without having to make a cut once you reach that point if you end up having to make cuts it's really bad i got pretty lucky with my bond on this as well it's worked to folds and halves to both sides of this background here and it even worked a full halves upside the window i had to do a little bit of expanding and squeezing which is very common and uh but i didn't actually end up having to make a cut a lot of times if you do end up having to make a cut what you'll do is you'll just take one of these brick maybe one from the end and cut half inch off of it maybe even an inch off of it and then that will allow you to get to a closer space now sometimes it's just the worst spacing possible and what you end up having to do is to make it not so noticeable because maybe you got to like lose two inches to make that bond work properly in that brick so what i'll do is to make it not so noticeable is i'll take uh you know like 10 mil off a of three or four brick space it out throughout the length of the wall here and then you won't even know that any of the brick are cut nobody will ever notice uh say so it looks like i got the light back on loading up my brick again and we're just about to the point of installing the ledge here and this is this is common industry standard here this is uh 
you know, I, I, I got this piece of angle iron. Unfortunately, the angle iron had just a little bit of a bend in it. Uh, I drilled the holes for it. I found the studs. I got some leg bolts and I painted it black to match the brick. Uh, you know, you, you may want to choose different colors depending on what brick you're working with, but uh, typically we just always paint the, uh, the angle iron black. And that angle iron is typically what you'll use to install brick on the outside of the house as well. So you can see me install it, level it here, and I'm right on gauge, right where I needed to be. And now that thickness of the angle iron here, this is quarter inch and my joints have been about three eighths of an inch up to this point because I needed to gain a little bit to hit this right perfect over top of the window. So now this course here, I'm going to squeeze on this course so that when I do get over to this point, this joint all the way along is going to be a quarter inch and you won't notice that one little bit. And that angle iron sits back about a half of an inch maybe three eighths of an inch from the front of the joint. So I'm able to fill that in with mortar as well. And now nobody knows the difference, right? You're over top of your window. You have a strong, sturdy uh, beam here to lay your brick on. And as soon as I get this course here, I would have liked to, you know, obviously you want to try to put some of those ties in right there, but I wasn't able to because that angle iron was four inches tall and these brick are only about three. So I got two courses on here now, and now I'm installing my next set of ties. You should see me installing my next set of ties. And then there's gonna be one more set of ties uh, once you get to the top here. One or two courses from the top, you're gonna to want to install your last set of ties. Uh, you always want, as soon as you can, over top of an angle. And then, you know, depending on what your spacing is. Uh, again, I put uh, as many ties as I could in this because there was no reason for me not to. And this is a trailer house, so there could be more flexibility. Uh, so I put tons of ties in and uh, my spacing vertically, like typically what it is, is it's staggered on 32 inch spacing. So I would have instead, because here I'm going every stud. So typically what you would do is you would go a stud, skip a stud, stud, skip a stud. And you do that along a wall and then you go 16 inches up and then you alternate studs and that's basically what your your spacing is you either go 16 inches up or 32 inches up depending on the code depending on what you're doing uh, again if you're using uh the industrial fasteners there's not as much of a need so you can probably go on 32 and 32. and these are my wires for my surveillance system which look like absolute dog shit, and i'm finally i'm glad to finally be able to hide these and um you know you'll see i guess uh you can see me when i'm joining here i'm using the brush and i i'd be perfectly honest for regardless of what i'm doing the brush is typically for split face block and split face brick i guess as well uh but for split face materials what typically people use the brush for i use the brush personally all the time because the brush makes a little bit less of a mess i can get a bit more aggressive with it and it doesn't smear wet mortar around on my brick if you've worked in the industry at all you may be noticing how clean i keep my material here uh, a lot some of this brick here is just the dirt from it sitting outside for a couple of years there are very few streaks on here from me uh back troweling essentially when I'm cutting the mud off and hitting the brick with little bits of dirt here and there. Uh, I've worked with some people who would have multiple smears, like mul like little marks like this. In insane, covering two thirds of the entire project, like multiple spear smears on every single brick. And it just, it's an absolute chore to have to clean afterwards. Now, uh, again, you know, unfortunately I'm not, I wasn't able to clean this before making this video. Let's have a little bit of a stock stop here and just talk for a second. Uh, maybe we'll stop just a little bit. You'll see me doing my space out here just to make sure everything's working properly. Just double checking. I already know it does. Uh, actually. Okay. So maybe that, uh, it's a little bit further on you'll actually see the piece here anyway so uh cleanliness is great now 
I have this clean enough that I'm not going to need to acid wash this. And you especially don't want to be acid washing in people's houses. And you want to be doing as little washing as possible in people's houses because it is going to release all that moisture back into the air. This is basically a humidifier is what this is going to turn into. It's uh, super humid in my house right now. Uh, the joints are just sweating like crazy. This is going to cure nice and slow. This is going to be very strong, uh, you know, relatively. And uh, so... I, I won't need to actually like I've I've cleaned so much brick and typically what we'll do for exterior for industrial brick is we'll go along with a, a mix of muriatic acid and I mean that's what we used to use I, I, was it muriatic or, or I can't remember what it is now it's a it's a bit of a weaker acid now but it's still pretty bad I've got actually sprayed in the face with it before from uh, that Nazi that I used to work for uh, <laughs> just crazy uh, just I was like <laughs> the guy's just standing on it anyways uh yeah it was, it, it's pretty bad it's pretty bad luckily it didn't get in my eyes uh sprayed right in the face anyways so I won't need any sort of acids or cleaners on this and I'm just going to once the joints get a little bit cured now I probably want to wait a little bit longer uh just so that I'm not putting any more water into this brick being that this is interior i don't have to worry in in that it's warm i don't have to worry too much about efflorescence and it, what ends up happening like let's say this is winter and you're going to try to wash this and it's cold out and it's the, the the mortar is still green if you wash this and then the all that brick and all those mortar joints soak up that water and then it freezes overnight for whatever reason it releases effervescence into the brick and you're going to get all sorts of that white crystalline mineral looking uh, contamination all over the bricks uh, now being that this is inside i could pretty much wash it you know the next morning it wouldn't have been that big of a deal but i want to wait a little bit you don't want to wait too long it's not like tile in that you have to wash it immediately after or else you end up having a bear of a time cleaning off all that dried uh grout it's not like grout this is i mean this is tech you know technically grout is what this mortar is but it's not like tile grout in that you have to clean it instantly uh i can wait a few days on this you know that it's very easy to clean this up afterwards and i'll just hit it with a brush i'll brush it really hard and i'll just kind of wipe it down and i don't want it you know i don't want to be coming in here with a hose and spraying this down as what you typically do outside uh so i'm just gonna you know i'll wet it down i'll spray it with a little bit of a sprayer and some water and then i'll scrub it really hard and then i'll try to give it a half decent rinse and it should be spick and span and then afterward if you want to seal it it will give it more of that glazed look but i'm not going to be sealing this because i don't want any of those uh be spraying those chemicals inside so that's pretty much cleaning now you can see me here installing my roll lock and again i'm not using lines in this this is all on the level and uh, I am fairly rusty considering like I used to okay this is me cutting that end piece here you know my my skills aren't there definitely aren't what they were at one point in time let's see if we can have maybe a little bit better of a look here when uh, this is finished you'll be able to see what that actually was well let's have a little let's see if we can have a little bit of a look here it's uh unfortunately i wasn't able to make this clip as long as i would have liked i tried to lengthen the time and slow the time down so you can see now what i did is i cut the inside of the brick out and i cut the back of another brick out otherwise you would have just the holes in this clay look here because this is essentially like a, a stained brick or a painted brick uh, so i cut that portion out i take the front of another brick and now what I'll end up doing is I'll just throw a ton of mortar down, I'll put the two pieces together, and I'll lay it in there. And it's super sloppy and moving around, and I end up really fiddling with this for quite a while. Uh, you just basically have to just sit there and keep, you know, holding it and, and, and you know, slicking the joints off. And eventually uh, it'll be hard enough that you can kind of let it go. And once, it gets, once it's cured, it's it's done it's good it ain't coming off there now i'm cleaning up i had a bit too much mud left over you know it's a bit embarrassing but uh that is what it is i just you know i hate having mud left over i was thinking about mudding these joints in but i'm just going to put some quarter round on there i actually want to have another look at that 
you know we can get uh, a better look at oh, a little bit too far just right to here I guess you can get a little bit better of a look right there at the uh, the roll lock itself from the side profile I'll try to capture it a little bit for it better for you this time right coming up here got that out of the way and these roll locks can be very tough if you don't have a lot of experience with them so you can see how it looks with the piece in and I end up having to put a little bit of a chunk of something in here that I took out afterward just because it wasn't holding up on its own now this is at a slant you can see a little bit rough I'm like I say I'm a little bit out of practice but uh, it'll pass from my place and uh, and that's it if you have any questions I do have a discord that I use for gaming uh, maybe I can leave that link in that description I, I, I do have a lot of uh, renovation stuff that I have on that discord or if you want to just leave some questions in the comments I can do my best to answer them I'm not a journeyman bricklayer I guess I should have maybe mentioned that at the beginning of the video I've been doing it for 15 years and uh, I've been on the tools full-time for about 10 years but uh, in this part of the world you don't really it's not really required for you to have your ticket so I don't know everything about everything and you know you may have you know criticisms of the way that I do things but uh, that's my best attempt at it and I hope I hope you like the video